Well, it only took two years and three months for the NTSB to figure out what went wrong with the mystery ship, you might remember, the A35 Bonanza, A743 Alpha, uh, that crashed in Curie, Nevada. Let's check it out. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to catch up with the final report recently issued by the NTSB wrapping up their investigation on the accident of the A35 Bonanza H743 Alpha uh, on the 24th of April, 2020. And it happened near Curie, Nevada, slash Elko, 65 miles away. <clears throat> I did a video on this accident shortly after the preliminary report came out virtually with no information from the prelim. I used ADSB data and my own computations based on uh, the airplane type, etc. cetera. Uh, the NTSB did not travel to the accident and recovery was left to local law enforcement. My main issue at the time uh, was there was no protocol to follow for local law enforcement when they respond to an aviation accident. I don't believe there's one that might be locally developed, but not from the NTSB. The NTSB does a good job when they go to the scene. And I believe there should be a protocol provided to law enforcement by the NTSB to preserve evidence to make a determination of what happened in the accident. One exists for the NTSB investigators. Why don't they share it to, for local law enforcement so they can collect data, they can preserve the data and make the observations that are required so we can actually use it. In my view, the primary reason to investigate an accident is to determine what happened, not necessarily why it happened so that future pilots can learn to mitigate and avoid such situations and prevent crashes and fatalities in the future. Um, the pre in the prelim report, the NTSB basically said that this particular airplane crashed near Curie, Nevada uh, at this time and with a certain weather, set of weather conditions and three fatalities. Fag at best. And, but now with the final report being published, we can get answers that we've been waiting for for over two years. You know, and a lot of folks out there lament uh, that when YouTuber, YouTubers, like me, put out a video on an aircraft crash and the pros of the NTSB haven't revealed the essential truth, they, they say it's a mistake. You just shut up and color and let them do their thing. So let's see how they did. The final's out. Let's see what we can learn from their analysis of the accident. In the history of flight section, the NTSB uh, report reveals an in three very short paragraphs of chronology of the accident flight. Under the heading of emergency descent, the report says miscellaneous other as the defining event, and that the landing was a hard landing. <clears throat> I think that's a reasonable supposition. Uh, in the aircraft owner operator section, the aircraft fuel tanks are explained. Uh, there were two bladder type main tanks with a capacity of 17 gallons each. There was a metal 19 gallon aux tank mounted in the airplane. They don't say where, and as I remember, the only place to put an aux tank in the A35 is in the baggage compartment, so you can't put a lot of bags in there because of that tank. The airplane had the capacity of 53 usable gallons of gasoline, and that gave it a range of just over four and a half hours and still air, perfect engine, perfect airplane. I don't think current airplanes can get that kind of service. You know, Book numbers are book numbers. They're not real world. The investigator could not determine what the fuel state was at departure, or did not determine it, and there was no evidence of stopping for gas along the direct line from Chandler to the accident site. Not stated was there was no uh, there was no wind fuel, that the sorry that the no wind fuel required was in the range of 47 gallons, 53 available, 47 required. The investigator did speculate that the distance flown was consistent with consuming the fuel in the main tanks only. A previous passenger reported that they had flown the, non, the trip nonstop before, so they'd done it. No real word on what the winds at altitude were, at the altitude they were flying. The investigator pulled the weather from Elko, Nevada, 65 miles away from the accident, giving the gusts, the winds at 280, 11 gusts 19. They used NOAA data to predict the weather at the scene, or determine the weather at the scene, uh, it's slightly unreliable, but they did determine there was no strong vertical wind shear below 12,500 that would support significant low level or clear air turbulence. I think that's pretty important. Uh, satellite data showed no indication of mountain wave activity in that area, 
and there were no PIREPs of hazardous weather turbulence reported over the route of flight. The first responders were from the sheriff's office, and they reported the aircraft impacted level terrain in a remote mountain valley at 6,539 feet, MSL. The aircraft impacted nose low and an approximate wings level attitude on a southwesterly heading. All major components were located at the accident site. There was no post-impact fire, and there was no fuel smell or fuel staining at the site. One of two, the two propeller blades had separated from uh, the airplane from the hub. <clears throat> this was in the report. And then when I looked at the docket, I found this. And this, what this picture is, is of the, uh, some con conversation notes taken during the discussions with the uh, two sheriff deputies, sergeant and the deputy, uh, who responded to the accident. I think it's important to note the wording used by the sheriff. What is missing in the report is his note that the airplane impacted in about a 30 degree nose low and wings level attitude. I'm going to talk a little bit more on this later. I think it's very germane to figuring out what happened. The flight control of, uh, continu continuity was confirmed. The flaps were partially extended. In the, that's what it says in the report. Uh, the landing gear was down and had pushed through the top of the wing. Uh, both main fuel bladders and the metal aux tank were compromised. That means they were broken and any fuel would have leaked out. They were in during the impact sequence, but no fuel staining was observed around any of the three tanks. That's sort of significant. Small amounts of fuel, you wouldn't, I don't think, see any, any staining uh, due to evaporation relatively quickly. Uh, no mechanical problem could be found in the engine that could have contributed to the accident. Doesn't mean there was one, uh, but they couldn't determine one. Uh, one propeller blade, as I said, had separated from the hub. Unfortunately, no notes exist about the bending or cord-wise scratching. In other words, what were the conditions of the blades when they found the airplane? The way a metal prop bends and the scratches it endures reveal in, that it endures in the impact reveal whether the engine was making power or not. That's a critical bit of evidence. A vertical vector of the airplane like this uh, on ground impact has very little forward movement and instead of bending the prop and scratching it, uh, releasing one or more of the blades, the vertical impact will commonly uh, break the hub and release a blade. So that, all those little things are details that help us figure out what happened. The final analysis summarized what I've told you so far and adds this. The extended gear and flaps suggest that the, this is quote, suggest that the pilot may have been maneuvering for a forced landing and lost control resulting in a hard landing. The reason for this forced landing could not be determined based on available evidence, end quote. Uh, and there's this too, also directly from the report. The airplane's fuel state could not be determined. Okay. The probable cause finding was the pilot's, and this is another quote, the pilot's failure to maintain airplane control which, uh, during a forced landing, which resulted in a hard landing for reasons that could not be determined based on the available evidence, end quote. Yeah. Over two years, and we didn't learn anything. We learned some more detail about the accident and uh, the configuration of the airplane, supposedly, but we really didn't learn the what. Uh, anything useful about determining what happened and what the sequence was. And, and again, the impact itself is only instructive in putting together the sequence of events to reveal why, you know, what is going on, what happened, you know, the, what failed and caused the whole routine is, it is what it is and happens in different, you know, it, most important to know how the pilot reacted to the problem. And so we can learn from it. Uh, one airport, the investigator did contact to determine whether the accident airplane stopped for fuel. He didn't there. The guy never saw him. Uh, but apparently no attempt to determine the fuel by in Chandler was made prior to departure to see what the airplane probably had, at least on board. And I don't think law enforcement officers did a really terrible job given that they had nothing to go on. They just did the best they can in a pretty gruesome situation. I feel for that. But perhaps in the future they could use a protocol developed for car accidents because we, they missed major pieces of evidence 
that were not collected or observed, and that, in my opinion, is a problem. I think the NTSB ought to develop a protocol and issue that so law enforcement can use it because they're the first responders most of the time. Was the engine producing power or even turning at ground impact? What was the impact sequence? Where was the point of first contact? What was the crash vector? What was the final and actual heading of the airplane? Uh, were there marks in sagebrush to support a low angle crash or a high angle crash? What did the impact crater look like? What were the dimensions? Was there any rotation on the airplane during the impact sequence? The ground scar would have revealed a lot about the impact sequence, yet we know nothing. <clears throat> in fact, we only have two pictures of the whole thing. If the aircraft had impacted nose low at 30 degrees, the nose, engine, and leading edges of the wings would show it unequivocally. They would, it's, it's very obvious when that happens. The investigator makes no impact, mention of impact angle. No, there's nothing on the, ac uh, on the accident sequence at all in the... Uh, in the final report, so we know nothing. We can't put nothing together about what happened and why didn't they survive kind of a thing. There is a, there's a lot of missing pieces of evidence that just frankly didn't get collected. And that leaves very little to go on, and I think that's a shame, particularly for the family and friends of the pilot and his passengers. What I can offer here in observations from the final, what, what can I offer in observations from the final report? There are only two pictures of this accident, like I, I said, and the site itself, we can go in and glean a little bit. It does not appear that there is a ground scar immediately adjacent to the wreckage. That doesn't mean that the aircraft had not impacted the ground prior and bounce, resulting in its final attitude. So in other words, hard landing bounce up and then down this way. The ground scar under the leading edge of the left wing shows some impact occurred, but not at a high speed. But the, and the upward folding of the leading edge is not consistent with a 30 degree impact. I've seen them before, 30 to 45 degrees are nearly vertical, and that leading edge isn't dead. The left wing tip and the fuselage behind the left window do show, in fact, some rotation at some point in the accident sequence. That's what, that wrinkling you see, that is a factor. That is a, a, an evidence, piece of evidence that we can use to figure out what happened what the sequence was. The sheer damage to the wing from the landing gear looks to me like a significant high impact of some kind, okay? What we can see in the picture of the right wing is a much cleaner puncture. So <clears throat> how did that happen? High energy and fairly low energy, but from this scan evidence, I'm not sure the investigator is correct in assuming the flaps were down. They don't look like they received the damage they likely would have given the damage received by the rest of the wing. It looks to me, <clears throat> with what little we have, it looks to me like they were broken during the impact sequence and came to rest in their present position. I would agree with the investigator that the gear was down, but I do not think that it was the only point of ground contact in the accident sequence. The wing scar, the leading edge damage, and the rotation evidence just don't support uh, the final, this as being the one and only final resting place of the airplane. Uh, in the whole accident sequence. If, in fact, the airplane contacted the ground earlier and then was thrown back into the air with more damage to the left wing because of that left wing impacting, say, one of these big sage brushes, uh, then more, the, the left wing was more damaged than the right, such an impact could have caused a left rotation, and I think that that is consistent with the evidence of what we see in the airplane, a left rotation thrown back into the air with still significant energy, the impact, then the aircraft impacted nose low, maybe as much as 30 degrees, a fairly high trajectory there from the first bounce, if that's happened. Two significant impacts like that would make survivability unlikely. But it appears to me the forced landing occurred, the pilot tried to land the airplane, and then things went horribly wrong. As to the cause of the forced landing, well, the fuel starvation does seem like the likely culprit, culprit but we don't know for certain. Uh, some of those things weren't captured. The bottom line is uh, very important evidence was missed in recovering this accident, and we will not get definitive answers to a lot of our questions about it. I'm saddened for the family and the friends of these folks. In situations like this, closure can really help with coming to terms with their loss. Uh, but given what we know and what lessons, we, what lessons can we learn 
from this accident? What can we do to avoid this in the future? Well, if you've watched any of my videos on forced landings before, you'll remember that I vigorously oppose putting the gear down unless you are absolutely certain without a shadow of a doubt that the surface is prepared in some fashion, not random desert, and most certainly not need a waist high sagebrush. Frankly, that does not qualify. Gear up is, uh, it, it's, it doesn't concentrate that energy dissipation into one little gear, which means a very quick deceleration. I can't predict whether they would have survived this accident with gear up, but just looking at the enormous energy dissipated by that left landing gear, I think we know that a gear up landing would have seen, would have seen that energy dissipate over a much longer distance and at slower deceleration rates. And frankly, slower deceleration rates is what it's all about. That's what survival is all about. They're a good thing. The other lesson is that it's very important to be conservative with your fuel. A fuel stop may be inconvenient, but it's far quicker and easier than a crash. So why risk it? In summary, the NTSB closed this case. They did. It's off their books. They did. They met their charter. But they didn't actually an adequately answer many of the questions that are posed by this accident. We, there's, how do we learn from this? It's our loss. Hope you liked the video update. I'd like to thank my Flywire supporters, Patreon supporters here. And if you'd like to support the channel, I will leave a link below. Really appreciate the support. No kidding. If you'd like to subscribe, it looks a bit like this here. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.